Another panel coming down is the image alignment and focus panel. And um, let me just go back to the program here. And I've got an example here of, of an image in buffer A. So imagine this one was just um, acquired. And with the number of buffers that I've chosen to scroll, the alignment buffer is buffer D. So that's what's here. And I can get to there with the home uh, with the insert hotkey, and you can see we have a shift between these images. So if I push a line to D, uh, I should start with zero image shift. Let me just do that. Okay, notice the image shift is now zero. If I push a line to D, it shifts the two images into alignment. I'm now toggling between them, and they're nicely aligned. And it also it imposes image shift on the microscope so that the next picture you take is going to be at the place you've just tried to align to. And if you clear the alignment, it goes back and it removes that image shift at the same time. So that's what those buttons will do. Um, now the reset image shift will clear out the image shift by moving the stage by a corresponding amount to try to keep the same specimen point centered. Now that's not perfect because any time you move the stage, you lose a, uh, a few tenths of a micron of precision in your positioning. Now moving stage for big mouse shifts is a way to avoid having to reset the image shift manually as you make large movements over a number of microns with this shifting. Uh, I didn't demonstrate the shifting. Okay. When you've taken an image, you can right click and shift it to wherever you want and it will change microscope image shift and the next image will show up superimposed on the position you have gone to. And as I said, reset image shift will re zero this out and change the stage position as well. So if you have this option enabled here to move stage for big mouse shifts, then um, when you do these right mouse shifts and they are big enough, either in absolute terms or as a fraction of the field, it will move the stage instead of the, the image shift. Um, and even if you don't have this selected, you can make this happen intentionally by doing the shifting with the shift key held down. Uh, another feature on here is centering the image shift on the tilt axis. And um, this is good for um, allowing for less lateral movement during a tilt series or during the operations that, that tilt from one uh, uh, tilt to another. But it does require an a calibration of the uh, offset of the, the tilt axis from the optical axis. And you'll see during the demos uh, how that's pretty easy to accomplish. Now let's talk about focusing. Um, this is an old standard technique of taking, autofocusing is done by taking two images with the beam tilted in opposite directions and measuring the shift between the images. And the rationale there is that if the specimen is in the focal plane and we have some point on the specimen, when we tilt the beam, that point is going to appear at the same place in the image with both directions of tilt. Um, but if we're out of the focal plane, um, then the tilted beam that's projecting to this point goes through a different image point in the two different conditions of tilt, which means we actually get a different image or we get a shifted image in the two cases. And the amount of shift uh, tells us how far away the specimen is from the focal point. So that's what happens. Um, and the autofocus button or the option in the in the focus menu will measure the defocus with this method and then change to the target defocus, which is the number you've chosen uh, to have it set to. Now, in fact, you'll, you'll see it take three pictures unless you've turned off this option called drift protection because it does exactly what I say. It protects against drift by, by being able to measure the drift by the, the amount of shift, comparing the shift between each pair of pictures and subtract that off. And there's also a nice little estimate of the, the drift in nanometers per second anytime you autofocus. Now another point I wanted to make about uh, focusing, because this comes up from people who have trouble with autofocus and I go through the sort of troubleshooting sequence with them and, and often this is a problem. 
Uh, the recommendation is to use bin subarea images. And there's, this is pretty important for several reasons. First of all, it's accurate enough because there's subpixel interpolation in the binning, and um, this is usually good enough to get a good estimate because you have a several pixel shift between the images uh, that you're measuring anyway. Secondly, uh, if you have any kind of non-constant drift, such as if you've just, just tilted and you want to autofocus, the drift is dying away slowly, um, you want to take those focus pictures as fast as possible with the shortest intervals between them. And so the binning is one way, as well as using sub-areas of making that happen. And the third point is a little bit more subtle, but it, it is a common source of problems. If you don't have a good gain normalization, then you have something called fixed pattern noise in, your, in all of your images, where all the images have single pixels that are the same or vary by the same amount. And what this means is when you cross-correlate those two images, they come up with a big peak at exactly zero shift in the cross-correlation. And binning will reduce this peak relative to the real peak, which is a nice rounded one um, that is not reduced by binning. Uh, so that, that there is some protection against uh, this built into the program, but the binning is another important component to that protection. Now let's look at what we can do with files. Um, obviously, we can save images in files. Um, and the way it's done is that we have typically have open files. So we can open new image files or we can reopen existing files. And the program can have up to eight files open at a time. And we can select or see which um, number is of the file is open with this rather cryptic two number three spinner over here. So you would use this to get from one file to another. And also, every time you switch from one file to another, you'll see the current file name that's shown in the program title bar change. Again, that's a little bit subtle way to indicate it. But if you know about it, that's, that's the way to see what's going on. Now, usually, if you use hotkeys or whatever to save your images, it's going to save the image in buffer A. And here's a button for that. But if you want to save the image you're looking at, whatever buffer you're looking at, say you've dialed up C, you can use Save Active, and it will save that. Now, once you have a file open and images have been saved into it, this is, these are this, these MRC image files, and they have a fixed format in terms of the type of data and the size. So once you've saved one image, you can only save other images of the same size. And so you will see these buttons gray out and come back alive as you take different kinds of images, uh, some of which can and some of which can't be saved in the file. Now, in the file menu, there's two entries for doing single image operations into other files without having to open them, without having to open them or leave them open. And so there's a save single or save to other, which will save a single image and read from other will read a single image from another file. Now, when you read from an image stack that is, op that is an open file, this read dialog box shows up, and it's very handy for scrolling through um, the images if you want to. Another point to know is that you can also read TIFF and digital micrograph files. You can't open them with the, um, the open existing file menu, but you can, you can read from other um, with those um, Uh, because it, it is going to be looking for a single image in those kinds of files. Okay, let's see where we are. All right, so when you go to open a new file, you will always come up to the File Properties dialog. And this gives you an opportunity to set the data type, which is usually either unsigned or signed integers. Um, and also, you get to set what items you want to save in the extended header. Now, the extended header is a sort of non-standard component of the MRC file that's been used for a number of years. And um, there's a limited number of things that can be saved in there. And recently, I realized this was kind of a dead end because it was very difficult for other people to get information out of here, very difficult to add more information in here. And so I have a new method of saving information called this MDoc metadata file. And it's a separate text file where 
all available information, not just the ones you ticked, can get saved for each Im image. And it's relatively straightforward. If somebody says, oh, I want to see the min, max, and mean of the image in that file, to have that added to the information that gets saved. Um, now, I was, didn't say here that when you save information in the extended header, it can be extracted with the, t with the extract tilts command in IMOD. And when you do the IMOD header command, <clears throat> it will show you exactly which options, what's in the header, and which options um, to use to extract that particular each kind of data. And in fact, extract tilts understands the same kind of data if it's coming from one of these MDoc files. And you may have noticed these capabilities for TIFF files. This one is a little strange, but if you want to save a single image to a TIFF file, you use the save single or save to other menu item. And then this TIFF file option is enabled, and you can do that. OK. <clears throat> One other thing I wanted to mention here was about preparing a gain reference. Um, so this is the gain reference dialog. And we usually find that taking a gain reference every day is just a good idea and gets things, um, uh, keeps things working pretty well. May not be necessary in some cases. Um, and the general recommendation is that you should do your gain reference at um, a sort of a higher exposure level, not what you need for low dose work, but more sort of mid-range um, exposure level. And the reason for this is that you need to have lots of counts averaged in these gain references to really not start to uh, normalize things by noise. And you really want to be at measuring very accurately the gain of the camera and not just the noise in your images. And so the recommendation here is to have at least 10 frames with at least a third of the, the dynamic range of the camera. If you do find, for some reason, because of nonlinearities, that you have to take your gain reference at a lower level that matches what you're taking in your low-dose images, then you should increase the number of frames um, so that you come up with the same total number of counts. Now, we have this capability to take a bin gain reference uh, instead of just the unbinned one, because um, the 4K cameras are very slow and really not very useful as 4K cameras, but more as 2K cameras. And then you can just sort of forget about the fact that it's 4K and take a bin gain reference as 2K and use the even binning um, that will be normalized from that. Uh, finally, if you have separately calibrated the number of counts per electron that your camera produces, um, and enter that into the property file, then this option down here becomes available, and you can calibrate the dose um, using the last image that's taken in the gain reference. 